here. You can see that uh, I've finished grading your exams. Uh, you should be able to uh, get into them and take a look at them at least for another week. I have them open for another week. Go through them and make sure, uh, again, there shouldn't be any mistakes in grading on, on the things like the multiple choice or the matching. But, but of course, if you do find something, you know, let me know. Um, and then, of course, in the essay question, the essay question is worth 20 points, and, I, and there's a rubric there. And that rubric is broken down into four points, uh, four categories, and then they're awarded points. Like, for example, if I ask you to write X amount of words for an answer, I'm not just doing that to be, you know, uh, bean counting. I'm not doing that. I'm doing that because I've written an answer out, and I've looked at that answer. I said, okay, this is a reasonable answer I could expect from a freshman biology student, right? And I, I've done this a long time, but this is what I would expect a freshman biology student to put together an account, I said, there's about, say, 200 words. So to me, an adequate, uh, fully detailed answer to the point where, you got to remember when I'm at home grading these things, I have to read and you have to convince me through your words that you understand this. So that's why I say just simply, you know, vomiting facts on a page or just, you know, disconnected sentences, you know, it's not going to do it. I got to know that you can explain it. So I get uh, you get points for the number of words. Grammar, I'm not real heavy or stickler on grammar. I don't care if you misused a comma, or that kind of stuff so much. It's really more a matter of clarity. If you write in such a way that it's hard for me to figure out, and some of you, not so much anymore because I've been emphasizing this, write in text speak, uh, speak speech. I have no idea what half that stuff means, right? So um, make sure you do write legibly and uh, not legibly but that i can that it makes sense because it detracts from your answer obviously then the third part that i grade you on is a part where i look do you use the right terminology and do you use that terminology properly and do you discuss things with the terminology do you tell me uh for example that uh when we're constructing proteins the first level of sequence involves the sequence of amino acids or do you say something like the first level of protein sequence is when a bunch of things are connected together there are they both right yeah one's got a little more detail to it right so that's where i'm going to grade you kind of in that part are you using the terminology using it properly are you speaking the language anything that we do any discipline has its own language doesn't it and then finally, at the very end, is kind of my uh, how well you've convinced me that you understand the concept. So if I've asked you about uh, protein structure, which is what I did, at the very end is sort of my summation of, all right, all the things I've asked in these questions, all the sub-questions, how well do I think this student understands? How competent are they with this concept? You might notice sometimes if you're reading through your answer that maybe you got 20 out of 20, and one of those little sub-questions you, you didn't even answer and you're like, well, I, you know, I got away with it. I do more of a holistic grading. Yeah, if you missed a little piece, like for example, what's the bond called between amino acids? If you didn't say peptide bond, but you wrote me all this other beautiful stuff about structure, and I'm not gonna ding you for that, right? You obviously understood that. Read through those essay questions, read through your answers. Uh, some of the comments are, 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 are canned, if you will. They're already put in there, and some of the comments I've added. But by all means, if you have any questions, concerns, or anything like that at all, come and talk to me. Don't wait till the end of the semester to figure out what you're doing wrong on essay questions or what you're doing wrong on exams. Make sure you get that nipped in the bud early on, all right? Um, so I'm looking at the grades overall in the class. I haven't really chance to analyze them too much. I mean, there's some students doing well and some that need help, but nobody, nobody's out of it completely, point-wise. In other words, looking at it very quickly, and you know, I don't do this math in my head, but just kind of roughly estimating, I don't see anybody who probably cannot pass the class at this point. You might not be able to get a, a an A, but you know a B, a C, but you're passing the class. So, if you need more information about your particular situation, let me know, and I can kind of help you with that. Sometimes students get a little freaked out. Remember, the, uh, we've gone through 176 points. The 76 being the scientific method, 
Oh, that's open too. So take a look at that as well. And then the 100 points for the exam. So we're really, was it 900 points for the exam, uh, for the test? So we're really about, about two ninths of the way through. So a little over 20%, plenty of time, okay? All right, any other questions, comments, concerns? Things I need to discuss uh, regarding that, things I need to discuss regarding the lecture we're getting ready to get into. Has anybody got any questions about cells and what they, how they do what they do and all those things that we've been dealing with so far, all those different parts of the cells? Cool stuff, huh? Because it's kind of like when you're a kid taking apart the, uh, uh, the, the, the car or whatever it is, the little train set, and trying to figure out how it works, right? Now, in my case, I wasn't much, much of an engineer. I could never, I could rarely get the things back together, but it was still kind of interesting taking them apart. So I like this, right? We're doing this in the cell. We're doing the same exact thing. We're taking it apart. So I believe when discussion with a few of you that this is where we left off. Let me double check one more time and see if I missed anybody coming in. Christopher, good morning. How are you? And Seth, how are you? That's everybody. All right, good deal. Everybody's good? All right, good deal. All right, so we left off on this slide, I understand. So what we were talking about when we were at this point is I was trying to get you to understand this idea of transport vesicles and this word vacuoles, and that things that are transport vesicles uh, aren't specific. They're, they just transport things, like a truck, a, 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 a semi going down the road can carry anything that it can carry. So vesicle, vacuole, they're all kind of words that are sort of interchangeable. So I don't want you to get confused because sometimes they do that. Like, for example, in, in, in plant cells, we talked about a central vacuole. I've seen that referred to as a central vesicle at times. Doesn't matter. It's a membranous, that phospholipids, right? It's a membranous sac is all it is. So a lysosome is once again a transport vesicle. So it's a transport vesicle generally, it's a lysosome specifically. The reason why it's a lysosome specifically is because of what's inside of it. Inside of a lysosome are hydrolytic enzymes. Now put the word hydrolytic in, in, in quotes there, right? Because I'm, I'm indicating to you that, uh, you know, you ought to know that word. That's, that those are enzymes that are going to help undergo that process of hydrolysis, right? And you remember what hydrolysis was. Was hydrolysis tearing them apart? Tearing the polymers apart, or was it putting them together? Do you remember? Hopefully you remember. What did we do in hydrolysis? Did Yeah, yeah, it tears them apart, doesn't it? So lysosomes would contain these things, these hydrolytic enzymes that could do that. And as I showed you, they can, it does it with food. The, the cell engulfs food. Remember, eukaryotic cells, not the prokaryotic ones, but eukaryotic cells are big engulfers. They're, they like to engulf things. So through phagocytosis or through the uh, what we can literally call cell eating, the food has been uh, brought into the where's my pen? Oh well, the food has been brought into the cell by engulfing. Then the lysosome moves along. Uh, once again, notice like dissolving like and all of the membranes are the same. Since the lysosome's membranes are made of the same thing <clears throat> that the food vacuoles membranes are made up of. Boom, they blend together, all those hydrolytic enzymes are dumped inside of the food vacuole, big chunk of food, small chunk of food, right? Simple enough. Now, we can also use these lysosomes to engage in something called autophagy, which is sort of a neat word because it literally means eating yourself. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know those old horror stories about the guy they dig up out of the grave and find out, oh my God, he wasn't dead when he was buried and he ate off his fingers? That's probably not true, but it's still... I'm going to eat my fingers here until someone knows I'm not really dead. But I, I guess that in the old, um, I was reading at some old cemeteries, they used to actually attach a line down into the, into the, into the, the uh, coffin and then up to the surface there was a bell. And if you were still alive, hope you would pull that string and ring the bell and someone would say, oh my goodness, that guy's not dead yet. Seems kind of interesting to me. Um, all right, but uh, autophagy in this case has to do with the fact that parts of the cell can go bad without the cell going bad. And I always use the analogy of your car. The starter of your car can go bad. It doesn't mean that the car is completely useless. You can replace the starter, which is relatively cheap, and you're back up and running. 
They can replace the car too, but come on now, why not just replace the much more inexpensive starter? So in this particular case, what we have is a lysosome that's actually merging with a, with a couple of things. It's merging with a mitochondria that's been encapsulated into a vesicle. Now this mitochondria is the starter in my analogy. It's gone bad, right? We're gonna get rid of it. Uh, we're gonna recycle it is what we're really gonna do. And then a peroxisome, which we'll talk about, when we talk about peroxisomes, a little bit later down the road. Yeah, we'll talk about peroxisomes just a little bit later. Uh, Hold on a second, folks. Where are we don't go? I guess we won't. Anyway, a peroxisome is another one of those that helps get involved in the in this in this breaking down of this uh, organelle. So the lysosome, the peroxisome, they both combine with that vesicle with the mitochondria in it, and the hydrolytic enzymes and the peroxisome digest and tear down that material and then recycle it. Okay, like you can see in the picture up above, there's a little peroxisome. Uh, a peroxisome, which uh, gets its name from the fact that it contains hydrogen peroxide in it. So it's real good at oxidizing things. So we're tearing stuff down, all right? So phagocytosis digesting food or lysosomes can be in, involved in autophagy, all right? Now sticking with this idea of membranous sacs, here's another one. <clears throat> this is the central vacuole. Now we talked about this when we discussed the cell in general. Now, who remembers why a plant cell, like if you look at that one in the lower right, for example, most of the cell, the volume is central vacuole. Why do plant cells have such large central vacuoles? What's the purpose of that? Um, could be, yeah, they need to store stuff in it. What do they, what do they typically are gonna be concerned about storing if they're plants? Yeah, if you were to expand that central vacuole out, you could give the shape some rigidity to the cell, like, uh, like Courtney suggests up there. But yeah, water, right? And it's so important, of course, for uh, plant cells to hold water because they can't go get it. Remember, we talked about that form and function. We're always putting those things together. What, is it, what does it look like in the cell? Why is it there? Why, in other words, why don't animal cells, when we look at them under the microscope, why don't they, why don't they have huge central vacuoles? Why aren't they concerned about storing water? Yeah, they can go get it, right? Plants can't do that. And as I said many times, the plant will actually be so full of water that most of the volume of the cell is that central vacuole like you see in the picture. It's crammed all the other organelles up to the edge like that. All right, now, um, if you are an organism like in the upper right, it's a different situation. These organisms in the upper right live in uh, typically in freshwater environments. Uh, I like the pond water stuff that we looked at. And in those type of, of environments, for reasons that I'll get to later on in lecture today, uh, water is continually pouring into the critter. This isn't an animal. Protozoans are not animals, they're not plants, they're protozoans. But it's almost like having a leaky boat, right? You have a leaky boat and the water is just kind of pouring in. Now, if you don't want the boat to completely sink in your leaky boat, you'd put a bilge pump. And that bilge pump would keep dumping that water over the side or the boat doesn't have to be leaking. Water splashes into a boat into a boat anyway, right? So you got this bilge pump that's pumping this excess water over the side. What we've done or what has happened in the paramecium is because they live in an environment in which water constantly is filling them up. Now this is physics. The paramecium can't do anything about that. As I said, we'll discuss why the water is going in a little bit later, but the end result is the water is pouring in. There's always a net gain of water. Now that's good for the plant cell and the plant cells really want lots of that water and they can deal with that because remember, if you fill up too much water, it's kind of like blowing up too much air into a balloon. That vacuole could burst. But in a plant cell, they have a cell wall, don't they? It's like blowing up a balloon in a box. The plant cell wall, you can stuff as much water into that water vacuole as you can. You don't worry. I mean, I suppose there's an upper limit, but you don't worry about the cell lysing or bursting. This guy doesn't have a cell wall, this paramecium. He doesn't have anything like that. If he takes on too much water, he grows and grows, and then he lyses and explodes, and I'm guessing he don't want to do that. So he takes a vacuole, right? Takes a membranous sac, 
and it's uh, there's no he or she in paramecium, so I'm sorry I'm giving them gender. Oh yeah, how are we? Uh, how's the connection now? Good. Okay. Yeah, let me know when that happens so I can make sure that I if I have to go back and repeat something. So what the paramecium has done with its central vacuoles turned it into what we call a contractile vacuole. And there's some videos on Blackboard in your in your resources that you can take a look at to show this, but you can actually see it in the still photo here. The contractile vacuoles are those things that look like little starbursts. And the one in the middle, uh, the one right here, is almost completely full. See, the water runs down these radial arms and it collects in these things, kind of like a lake, kind of like rivers collect into a lake. And then in order to get rid of the water, the excess water, these contractile vacuoles do, well, they do exactly what they say, they contract. So the one on the left and the right, the one on the right especially, has contracted. So it squeezes that water out. A little bit of water gets squeezed out. And then as soon as that water gets squeezed out, those radial arms, those like rivers, begin to fill back up again, and then it begins to fill back So it's constantly doing that. And it allows it to maintain that word yeah, or that or, or that concept that we've talked about from the beginning, right? Homeostasis. You want to have enough water, but you don't want to have too much water. Membranous sacs, right? They're kind of interesting when you think about it. Remember also, too, I told you that um, vesicles and vacuoles and plants could store things that would make them, say, uh, distasteful to predators. Right? Plants have predators. Herbivores come along and eat a plant. That's a predator of the plant, and plants can't run away. So maybe if you make some chemical poison ivy comes to mind right away uh you make it like ooh, don't want to mess with that again all right okay um the next group of things that i want to talk about in the cell this next group of organelle or components is something collectively we call the cytoskeleton whenever we see the word cyto it refers to something with the cell it's some root but this is the cytoskeleton uh, now, there's not really a skeleton like our skeleton, obviously, but what we mean in this case is more skeleton in function than in form the way we have it. This is a picture of a cell, and what they've done is they've, uh, an actual photograph, is they've gotten different components of the cell based on what they're made up of to glow different colors. So the things that are in the, in the yellow represent one type of the cytoskeleton that we're going to talk about. Uh, the things in the green represent another type. The big blue thing in the middle there, that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a nucleus. Uh, notice a couple of things before I go on into more detail on this. Notice how the green things all seem to be, uh, it, it, you can see, sort of anchoring and holding the nucleus in place, and that's important. Notice how all the orange things, all the orange things are around. Yeah, it does look cool. I love the way they can do that. Uh, spell cytoskeleton, Penny? I'm sorry. Notice how the orange things are focused or concentrated around the outside of the cell. All right. uh, seeing where they're located, seeing how they're put together, and this is what is so beautiful about being able to take microscope shots like this, really helps us put together what they do. So the first ones I want to talk about are the orange ones, right? The ones that are right up underneath the cell membrane that basically kind of outline it, okay? Those things are called actin or... Uh, or a microfilaments. Microfilaments, because they're real small, you can see on the right, I don't really care about you knowing the size, seven nanometers is the size, but actin is a protein, all right? And what they've done with these proteins, these little actin subunits, little beads of proteins, is they link them together and then they twist them. Now, what this makes is it makes, essentially it makes like a rubber band structure, all right? It actually makes a structure that's got some stretchability to it. And what this thing, this, the, these microfilaments do, as you can see in the first part, says it's the maintenance of cell shape. They're tension-bearing elements. Now, I'm not an engineer, but if you've had any sort of you know, discussion about that, what we mean by tension uh, is like when you pull a rubber band apart, you're increasing the tension. So what the yellow, L, or, I'm sorry, the orange elements do, these stretchy actin fibers, they allow the cell to stretch, but kind of keep it from pulling apart. You, you know, if you took a rubber band and you stretched it far enough, right, it would bust. Well, the actin filaments are preventing that from happening. So as all the liquid part of the cell is moving around, then these actin filaments are absorbing the stress so that we don't pop the outer membrane. Now that does happen, you know, as we talked about, you know, if you absorb too much water, 
but these guys are there to try to prevent that from happening. That's what we call them tension bearing elements. Now, all the components of the cytoskeleton, and there are going to be three that we talk about, this is the first one, have multiple duties. All right? For example, the one I, the actin filaments, they're responsible for keeping the cell in shape, uh, changes in cell shape, muscle contraction, uh, cytoplasmic streaming. I'll show you that in the, actually, I'll show you that in the next picture. Uh, cells being able to move around, I'll show you that in the next picture. And then in, later on in the chapters when we get into cell division, microfilaments come, at, come on again. There's a little picture down below. The green uh, around the outside, those are microfilaments. And that cell is in the process of dividing. We actually, when you looked in the microscope the other day under the uh, onion cells, you saw some that looked kind of like that, didn't you? Do you remember seeing some of the chromosomes that seemed like they were pulled apart like that? Yeah, you might not have been able to see the microfilaments, but in some of them, you actually were able to see the microtubules, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, yeah, muscle contraction. So uh, actin filaments are responsible for your muscles uh, contracting together. If we looked at a muscle cell up close, uh, there are two types of protein filaments. There's the actin one, which is the stretchy intertwined uh, uh, protein and then there's a myosin filament and what's so so cool about this i told you the other day that muscles can only contract they can't push they have to they, they're pulled together that's the only way they work um and the way they they pull together is if you see the red arrows down here it's showing you the overall uh, movement of the muscle cell muscles are going to get shorter they're going to overlap each other that's what these uh, arrangements of these filaments are going to eventually do when you pull them across. And the, uh, and the overlapping is going to be brought about because if you look on the myosin filaments, the purple ones, look right there, see? The myosin filament is this part here, but it's also got these little heads. That, and exactly, that's what they're called. And those heads are powered by ATP, that energy. And what they do is those heads, see if I can uh, get it in the camera here, is they grab the actin filaments, so I'm just gonna have two, two of the heads, right? And they pull. And they work kind of like pulling a rope, grabbing it, pulling a rope, grabbing it, pulling a rope, grabbing it. But what they do is they don't all let go at the same time. So while some are pulling, some are holding. So uh, not holding in place, but they're not letting go. So then when these move back, what we call the recovery stroke, then other of these heads are holding it in place. It's really cool. Take A and P, you'll learn a lot more about that. But it's really, you can see up above, that's actually a picture of these uh, of these filaments. It's called the sliding filament theory. If you take A and P, I guarantee you'll hear that word. These filaments slide past one another. Now, the actin filament, the nice thing about that is it allows uh, that myosin filament to pull on it, but it's got a little give to it. It's stretchy. So, you, so, so, got a less chance of pulling your muscle that term that we use right less chance of actually stretching these filaments beyond their their capabilities down below is an amoeba now they're not blue i wish they were because whenever i uh what kind of worm whenever i try to help students find amoebas under the microscope i get a lot of just junk under the microscope i always tell students if you think it's an amoeba it's going to look like a blob but there's going to be stuff inside that's moving See, uh, amoebas are all, it's called cytoplasmic streaming, the stuff inside of it. You have a picture of it? Unless it's the one you saw under the microscope. There are some flatworms that you can find out here in Florida. Yeah, send it to me. Now, the amoeba, when it wants to move around, moves around through these things called fake feet. Isn't that a cool word? Pseudopodia. <laughs> oh, that worm. Yeah, you did. That's right. Uh, that wasn't a natural, but we do have naturally occurring flatworms too. But anyway, the way an amoeba moves is, is very simple. If that amoeba in this picture wants to move off to the right, like you see the black arrows, it just starts taking its cytoplasm and shoving it into that area of the cell. So that means the organism wants to move. And as a matter of fact, you can see down here, this is the nucleus of it right here. Uh, but anyway, the actin filaments are found, remember, just lying right along the edges. They provide flexibility to allow that cell, those pseudopod, to extend, you know, to grow, to take on that pressure of that cytoplasm being pushed into them without bursting. All right. So it's, again, this idea of they have multiple tasks. Um, up above are cells from a plant called Elodea. 
I'm going to stick on this just a second because I got a couple of couple observations I want you to help me make. All right, those are all LDS cells. Look a lot like the onion cells, don't they? Sort of regular arrangement. Uh, the actin filaments help the uh, help the help the the cell engage in what we call cytoplasmic streaming. Now, why is cytoplasmic streaming occur? Because the cell always wants to stay mixed. All of these molecules that come together in a cell, like we've talked about before, come together through chance, right? They bump into one another. Well, you increase that chance as everything is mixed. And one of the ways they mix it <laughs> is the chloroplasts of these photosynthetic cells. LED is a photosynthetic plant, obviously. The chloroplasts get dragged along the actin filaments. They get moved along the actin filaments and they go around the outside of the cell. And as they're doing it, they, they're, the, they're the stir or what would, when you do that with a mixer. The beater arms, the beater, whatever the heck you lick after mom's made a cake. They, they end up being that thing that stirs up the liquid of it. And they're doing that because the actin filaments are help pulling them along. What I wanted to ask about this cell is if you take a look at it, well, not ask really. Do you notice that it looks like all the organelles are crammed up along the edges? Now, remember, this is a three-dimensional cell. So even though you see something like this, I was to look at the cell from the end, that may still be at the edge. It might be at the top edge. But anyway, you'll notice that all of those cells are mostly a big clear area. What organelle is that that makes up that big clear area in these photosynthetic plant cells? So all the organelles are crammed around and there's something in the middle. It's a plant and that's the central vacuole. Very good, thank you, thank you, excellent. All right, uh, those are microfilaments. Let's go on to the next group. This is a little bit bigger. These are called intermediate filaments. Um, and you can see in the little picture on the left-hand side are some uh, uh, intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments act like um, foundation. All right, let, let me explain. First of all, let's get uh, the, 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 the form or what it's made up out of the way. Intermediate filaments are made of keratin proteins, that, that stuff in your hair, that stuff in your nails, and it's been coiled together. So they're a little bigger. They're 8 to 12 microns. So think about, uh, think about intermediate filaments as being like steel cables in terms of the way they're constructed. Very flexible, but very strong, right? Okay, here's the use part of it. The, on the left is a electron microscope picture of your uh, of your intestinal guts, your your intestinal your your guts your intestine either way. Uh, so imagine that this is the part of your intestine where food, maybe that bagel that you had for breakfast, is floating by, and and the job of this part of your gut is to absorb the food. Now, if you look very closely, there are these things called microvillus or microvilli in the plural. A microvillus or many microvilli are little fingers that extend out into your digestive system, right? Little, uh, little fingers, little extensions of cells that extend out into your digestive system. And they have a whole bunch of surface area because there's a whole bunch of these little fingers. Looking at what you know about surface area to volume ratio and knowing where this is located in the body, why don't we... Uh, Put both of those, try to put both of those together. What do you think the purpose of all those microvilli is? Why, why are there all these little finger extensions in the intestines of your body? What, why is it, why are the cells constructed that way? Finally, I get to a question. Form and function, form and function. Uh, it, it, to catch, not catch, someone to absorb, to absorb. And Courtney says more food. Why would this absorb more food, these microvilli, versus if the cell was just flat? Because if the cell was just flat and didn't have the microvilli, it still would absorb. But why is this better? More surface area, right? More surface area, more area for food to be absorbed, right? Exactly right. Okay. Now, the intermediate filaments. If you look down below the microvilli, uh, and, 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 and they're flexible and bouncing around, and that's because they're made up of those actin filaments. But now, you got to have an anchor, and that's what the intermediate filaments do. The intermediate filaments provide the basal anchor, so they're a little bit sturdier. They're still flexible, 
but they're not like the uh, micro villi. They don't like the actin filaments, like rubber bands that go back and forth. Uh, you might think about the intermediate filaments as maybe being a thicker piece of rubber. Still flexible, but still pretty strong. And you can see right here, it fits very nicely with the way it's put together, right, with the fact of its durability and what it does. It's quite clearly the anchoring for these wiggling microfilaments, these actin filaments that are found in the micro villi. Okay? Now the big boys. We're moving beyond strands now to tubes, and we're now going to make microtubules. This is the last component of the cytoskeleton, and we can do, or plants, I should say, can do lots of things with microtubules. First of all, what is a microtubule? Well, actually, it, it, it is a column. So if you look down the lower right, 25 nanometers across with a hollow opening. It's a pipe that's made up of these little alpha and beta tubulin proteins. And they come in pairs. There's one alpha, one beta. So we call them a tubulin dimer. So each of those tubulin, those tubulin dimers ranges up and makes a, a, a pipe, a corkscrew arrangement, so you have a hollow pipe. And of course, uh, pipes uh, 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 very often do what pipes do. They transport things, right? Well, these pipes also have other functions. You know from engineering, uh, you can make something very strong and very lightweight by, by, by constructing it this way. Right? You can take a piece of metal pipe, and it doesn't have to be solid steel all the way through. Uh, you can get a, a, a tremendous amount of strength just by using the edges of the pipe. And, of course, if it was solid steel all the way through, it would be not only doggone expensive, but pretty, pretty doggone heavy, too. So these microtubules, if you think about it, and you look down in the part in parentheses, it says they're compression-resisting girders. Yeah, that's what they do. They actually resist. So whereas the actin filaments prevented you, and the intermediate filaments to some extent, prevent you from pulling the cell apart, <clears throat> excuse me, these guys would prevent you the cell from being mashed, right? So they would be the girders like in a building. Now, like I said before, they come in lots of other jobs as well. Like for example, microtubules are the major structure found in cilia or flagella, which we'll talk about in just a second. They're also involved in moving chromosomes around. Another really cool picture down below, uh, the orange in the picture, that's all the actin filaments. The purple little worm things are the chromosomes. The green um, are the microtubules. And the microtubules, as we'll learn when we get into that, are actually gonna pull those chromosomes around. They're gonna separate those chromosomes. And now you notice when we looked at the, uh, uh, at the intermediate uh, filaments, they uh, basically uh, looked like they were uh, anchoring that nucleus in place so that, yes, the organelles of a cell are anchored in place, but they do need to move as well. Sometimes they need to be moved based on the cell needs, and I'll show you how that works. That's very cool, actually, too. I'm going to go back to cilia, cilia and flagella for just a second, but I want to show you one more structure because I just – actually, I want to show you – Forget the cilia and flagella. I want, to, I want to move on for just a second. I'll come back to that. I was looking one place and going the other thing. These right here. Chromosomes. Same thing as the little purple things that you saw under the microscope the other day in lab. <clears throat> So I'm sorry I mentioned cilia and flagella. I was looking at the wrong place on my other screen. But no, I'm going to go back to microtubules and this idea of moving things, moving organelles around. Check this out. This is how it happens. So they got a vesicle up top. Contains something. It's, it's, a, it's a container. It's like one of those pods that you rent, right? And there are receptor proteins on it. And those receptor proteins, like anything else, uh, have a shape. And, 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 and these receptor proteins, they have the shape that allows a motor protein to fit very nicely into the receptor protein. Now, the shapes may not be exactly like this, like I've talked to you before, but you still get the idea. The little motor proteins have these, have these discs on them, all right? And they're attached to a microtubule, the thing we just talked about, that pipe. The ATP is energy. When you apply energy to the motor proteins, they're ATP powered, they walk up that tube. So one little uh, circular red foot-like thing comes forward, then the next one, then the next one, then bup, 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 and that little vesicle gets moved along. Isn't that neat? There's a picture down below of, the, of a scanning electron microscope. That's what SEM is. Scanning electron microscope 
of a uh, of a of a giant squid axon, a giant squid axon, a nervous cell. And you can see there's the vesicles, there's the microtubules. You can't see the motor proteins and all that other stuff, but that vesicle is moving down that microtubules, and it's being done by these little walking proteins. I'd love to be able to see that happen. Little vesicles moving around. Very cool. Okay, uh, we're still sticking with uh, microtubules. As I said, microtubules and a lot of other cytoskeleton things can do lots of things. But in animal cells only, and I put it in red to remind you, animal cells have an area in them called a centrosome. And in this picture, it's the yellow area. It's kind of like the nucleoid region in a prokaryote. I mean, there's no, nothing really there, but it's where the nucleus is. The centrosome in animal cells, plant cells do not have these, the centrosomes in animal cells give rise to this pair of centrioles that you see like that. And one is arranged one way and one is arranged the other way. You can actually see in the microscope picture down below. But these centrioles, we always talk about them as being in a pair because they occur in pairs, are made up of microtubule triplets. Right? So they're made up of triplets of those pipes stuck together. Now, what exactly do the centrosomes and the centrioles do? Well, in, in the, we think we have an idea of what they do in animal cells. What's even kind of a bit puzzling, though, is the fact that why they're not in plant cells. And I'll talk about more of that when I get into cell division, but it does have something to do with cell division. So animal cells have that pair of centrioles made up of those microtubules. Function, we think we know, plant cells do not. Okay. Oh, cool. Now cilium flagella. All right. Cilium flagella. Big, big topic first. What's the difference between the two? Cilia are smaller, thinner organisms have lots of them. Small, thin, lots. Flagella are longer, thicker organisms generally have fewer of them. Sometimes just one. Sometimes a half dozen, but they don't have fewer. Usually if you have cilia, you're covered all over in cilia. Now, whether you're the long, thinner flagella or the shorter, thinner cilia, you're made of the same stuff. So let's start on the left-hand side of this. We've got another electron microscope picture of the longitudinal section of a modal cilia, singular of cilia. So this is one of those little hairs. And if you look inside of there, there they are, microtubules again. And what's really cool, the next picture you're looking at, it's showing you how the cilia or the flagella, this is a cilia, you're right, uh, of course, is actually thinning as it goes towards the top. Because you look down at the basal body and you can see that uh, you've got triplets of those microtubules. Maybe this picture is a little better one, right? So you've got three of those pipes arranged together and they've got radial spokes and, uh, and, and proteins that connect them together and all that sort of stuff. But up here at the top, the triplets become a doublet, right? So it's three at the bottom that converges into two pipes at the top because the cilia or the flagella, like I said, is getting thinner. All right, how do they work? Motor proteins again. This time we're called dynins. There are motor proteins, all little red things, between those triplets or doublets, if we're at the surface or at the tip of, of, of microtubules, okay? And the way they work is very much like uh, this this device down here works. You know, if you got a wheel and you got a paw, which is a little ratchet thing at the top, you turn the wheel this way, the paw goes click, 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 but the wheel won't go the other way unless you pick up the paw, right? Everybody familiar with a mechanical device similar to that? My grandfather used to have a self-walking uh, lawnmower that did that. Every time the thing would spin around, the wheels would turn forward and had a little paw that would keep it from going the other way. Click, 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 click. Yeah, yeah, Christopher. Oh, uh, uh, recovering your boat on a boat trailer. Same thing. The winch you pull your boat up on a trailer is, is the, it works the same way. All right, now, what that, in a plant cell, that's been translated into those motor proteins because what those motor proteins do is when they move in one direction, depending on which way we want to wiggle the flagella, they stay in that one direction until they're ready to go the other direction. Now, the way it works is imagine my two hands are two triplets of, of, of microtubules. So this is the triplet 
This is a triplet. And they're together and the motor proteins are between them. How do I make the cilia or flagella move back and forth? Those motor proteins walk up and down the tubes past each other. So now I've only got two arms, folks. But if you can imagine a bunch of these rods moving up and down in unison, because they got that pawl that keeps them going in the same direction until it's released, that means that everybody on one side of the flagella might be going down, while everybody on the other side of the flagella is going up, and the result is the flagella bends that way. And then on the opposite occurs. These tubes are going up, these tubes are going down, and the flagella bends this way. Now, if you do that real fast, you got a flagella, don't you? All because those little motor proteins are walking very, very quickly up and down. Flagella, cilia, I'm sorry, I keep using the words back and forth, but uh, again, the only difference is size. Right? Sperm usually have one, uh, well, sperm have one flagella. So organisms generally have one, and like I said, it's bigger. And then, like, that's a paramecium down below. That's what I was asking you guys to do with the microscopes the other day, right, when I was saying to play with the focus, see if you could see the cilia. It's really very cool the way the cilia work on, on. It's not just randomly the way these things are waving back and forth. They all do it in unison, and that's why these critters have they're very acrobatic in their movements sometimes. It's amazing. They can stop on a dime and turn it's because of all this coordination that works. Speaking of sperm, I think sperm are interesting. This is a pig sperm, I believe, on the left-hand side. Uh, the picture, which is actually a GIF in the upper right, the little cartoon, shows you that the, uh, the tail of a sperm is actually broken into more than one section that wiggles on its own, but the end result of each of those, cell, those parts wiggling is the, um, the tail of the sperm actually is, propels it by spinning. And again, I go back to a boat, right? The screw or the prop of a boat, that's how that works. I mean, you could propel a boat forward by something waving back and forth. I wonder why we never built boats like that. Why didn't we ever build a boat that the propulsion was a, a fin, like a, like a fish you'd probably to shake the whole damn thing apart. But the spinning is a lot better, right? Sperm aren't, aren't slow either. They obviously have some place to be, don't they? I've got some interesting little ooh-ah facts. Yeah, not as efficient, absolutely. 500 miles an hour, the size of a whale, 15,000 miles an hour. We all know what sperm do, but the reason they're in such a hurry is because, well, they don't last very long. you got your job to do, and if you don't find the egg, then we don't need you. Poor males. Okay, the last three slides, what I want to discuss is so what I call modifications to the surface cell or the cell of the surface of the cell. So modifications to the cell based in this discussion based on what type of cell they are. So I'm going to start with a plant cell. Plant cells, as you know, have a cell wall around them. And that cell wall is a thick, uh, durable structure that is uh, difficult to get through, if you will. Doesn't mean you can't, things can't permeate through it. But it's not as easy to permeate through a cell wall as it is, say, through a cell membrane. Now, organisms that have a cell wall, like plant cells, have a cell membrane, too. But this is going to be specifically focused on getting things across the cell wall in a plant cell. So if you look at the picture down below here, I've got a handful of plant cells all arranged together with their brown cell walls all next to one another. Now, cells, if they want to be efficient, like to work together cooperatively. I actually had this discussion with my Bio2 students yesterday because we were talking about prokaryotes. But uh, in order for cells to work together cooperatively, they've got to be able to communicate. And we've talked about communication before. You know, there's oral and visual and all those other kinds. But there was another kind that we came up in class was smell, wasn't it? Smell is communication. Chemicals moving between A and B is communication. Your hormones being released in your pituitary that affects the sex cells in your gonads is communication. That hormone is released at a certain time of your life, and then you, those cells and the sex cells are, are, are prompted to you know, become sexually mature. We did this when we were talking about proteins the other day. So uh, uh, the easier two cells or a group of cells can communicate, the more efficient they're going to be. And someone said efficiency a few minutes ago. Courtney did. Things that are efficient are being favored in living organisms, all right? So what plant cells do to increase the efficiency of communication is in the cell wall, there are these little holes. They're labeled there, plasmodesmata. And if you look in the microscope on the right, you can see those plasmodesmata do exactly what you would expect them to do. They're bridges between cells. Those are two cells, right? 
and this is the space between them. Look up here, the space between two cells is rather formidable. There's a middle lamella, which sticks the cells together, helps hold them. There's a thinner primary uh, cell wall. Then there's a secondary cell wall. So there's a lot of, and not including the membrane, there's a lot of steps that the molecules got to go through to move from one cell to the other, obviously. So that's something that has to be considered if you want increased efficiency. Now, plant cells, their solution to this was produce plasmodesmata, little holes between them. Okay? There's only one I'm going to talk about in plant, plant cells. Does anybody have any questions about what a plasmodesmata looks like and what it does? All right, now with animal cells, it's a different story. <clears throat> animal cells have the need to bond together and to make collections of cells, just like plant cells do. Animal cells uh, are very good at doing that. And actually one of the hallmarks of animals is this combination of cells to make tissues. Now, a lot of time that word tissues is used for a variety of different organisms, but among zoologists, the hallmark of what a tissue is, is exhibited in animals. Animals have taken this collections of cells and formed them into aggregate groups that do particular jobs as tissues, much better than any other type of critter. But of course, again, with animal cells, we're not talking about all of that as much as we're talking about, you know, these modifications that occur. But I want you, I wanted you to know what the outside of an animal cell looks like, all right? So this is the inside down below. You see the microfilaments, the little spongy things that are attached to the inside, little stretchy things. There's the phospholipid bilayer, okay? Uh, there's the plasma membrane, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the protein, some, are, some of them are integral, the intricans, the ones that are on the outside. Some are peripheral, some of those proteins. Two major components of any cell membrane, folks, is gonna be those phospholipids and all these proteins. Uh, on the outside, in this thing we call the extracellular matrix, or the ECM in animal cells, there's this mix of stuff. There's, there's collagen, that protein that we talked about. There's a green, spiny, wiry substance called a proteoglycan complex. So that's a protein and a sugar put together. And then the collagen and the uh, proteoglycan, uh, uh, proteoglycan complex are all wound together. And they're attached to some of these proteins that are in the phospholipid bilayer by, by, by another protein called a fibronectin. So what basically animal cells have done, they don't have a, a cell wall, is they have this, oh, I wish I had a good analogy to come up with, but they have this outside structure of collagen and this proteoglycan uh, complex that's all wired together that forms sort of a, a, a sac. Oh, that's not good, but, but, but sort of a, there you go, thank you, sort of a chain mail. Yeah, kind of a chain mail arrangement, a very loose chain mail arrangement around the outside itself. Thank you, Courtney. That's not bad. I like that chain mail. Okay. Now, of course, it's not chain mail in the structure like you know, with, it, it, as hard as uh, what the knights used it for. But you get the idea. It's it's like a it's like a weaving of material. Okay. Give it some protection. All right. So that's what the outside of an animal cell looks like. Very different in a plant cell. Remember, they got two cell walls with the middle lamella. Very very relatively simple picture. Now about modifications to animal cells. And first, let me remind you of these animal cells that you're looking at. We saw them before. These are the ones with the microvilli. So once again, we're talking about some intestinal cells and along comes your bagel from breakfast, floating along. So the microvilli are there to absorb the bagel. All right, very good. Um, let's start with the gap junction first, the one at the bottom. Now, the reason why I want to start with that one is that is the uh, analogous version of a of a plasmodesmata in a plant cell. A gap junction is exactly what it is, or maybe better in red. It's a communicating junction. It's actually, if you look at the picture, it's a series of proteins. Maybe this picture is a little bit better of a gap junction. It's a series of proteins that make a uh, channel, right, between adjacent cells so that ions and small molecules can very quickly move between, right? So they have to go through the phospholipid bilayer. 
as a matter of fact, you'll learn a little bit later on in chapter five today that ions many times, they can't go through the, well, not many times, but ions can't go through the phospholipid bilayer. They're, they're polar. Ions have a, a charge, so they're polar. And in the middle of that phospholipid bilayer are those hydrophobic tails. And they don't like polar things. They don't allow polar things to come through. So we put a protein channel between them. There you go. We've got a conduit. So that's like a plasmodesmata, isn't it? Now, plant cells have to, or I'm sorry, animal cells stick together, okay, uh, but they don't have the cell wall, which is what plants do, but they do have their version of ways of sticking together, and that brings me to the next one, which is called a desmosome, desmosome. Desmosome, or sometimes they're called a spot desmosome, because they look like a spot. Desmosomes involve components of the cytoskeleton, those intermediate filaments. It's in the label there. What happens in a desmosome is intermediate, intermediate filaments of adjacent cells form this uh, plate, that purple plate that you can see there. You can see it in the picture too. And that plate welds together those two cells. So that's like rivets. And I put it in quotes there to indicate what I'm talking about. So that's what I mean by spot desmosomes. It's like a spot weld. All right, so you, uh, in addition to the extracellular matrix, and of course, then there's the, uh, 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 you know, there's all the other uh, parts that are holding this together. Uh, a desmosome is a spot weld. Yeah, it's two, it's intermediate filaments bonded together, the kind of glues. Um, or if you think about it, it's a spot of glue, like Elmer's glue. A little spot of glue, and those plant, or those animal cells stick together. Did you get that, Jordan? Okay. Now, the last one, the tight junctions up at the top. Now, what a tight junction is, let me show you what it is first. If we take two adjacent cell membranes, both phospholipids, and we have a protein in one, that protein can stick to a protein in another one. Excuse me, I'm trying to do this right-handed. But anyway, proteins and adjacent cells bond together. And they do so, if you look up there, near the top of these particular cells. So tight junctions, in this case, have a very specific function. And it's a quilting kind of arrangement, isn't it? That winding, sort of braided, spiral arrangement means, just like when you quilt something, there's a lot of uh, overlapness in this. Now, the reason why that is, is what tight junctions do is they prevent fluids, the red arrows that you see there, they prevent fluids from leaking down between the cells and getting down, for example, down where the extracellular matrix is and destroying that. In other words, destroying the foundation that that cell has been uh, is built on. Now, what kind of fluids would that be? Well, remember, we're in your digestive system. So even though a lot of it that goes to your digestive system you want to absorb it's food some of it is waste and you don't want that waste product leaking down between your cells and potentially causing problems because what will happen it's kind of like if you don't oh well it's kind of like not grouting the tile in your bathroom up against the shower wall the water will go through uh you know the grout lines of the tile and ruin the drywall behind it so you grout it don't you so tight junctions, if we could look at this from the top, these cells, these microvilli, I'm going to draw them square just to make it easy. The tight junctions would form the grout between them, all right? So we have something that controls fluid leakage, something that helps some, uh, rivet or stick the cells together, and something that helps the, helps the cells be more efficient. Any questions on that? I'm going to switch over to Chapter 5 so we can get started on that. We won't finish Chapter 5, but we can at least uh, get a, make a good dent into it. Any questions on Chapter 4? There we go. All right, I'll go on to Chapter 5 then. All righty. Chapter five is all about the membrane. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the membrane, not so much about the structure because you're pretty familiar with that already, but really more about the functional part, really more about how does the membrane do its job, which is differential 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not differential, but which is selective permeability. The cell membrane is selectively permeable, which means exactly what you might think it means. It means it lets some things through, but not everything. And this picture is not out of your book, but you should probably recognize that, you know, the blue is the hydrophilic heads that face out towards the water and in towards the water. And then the yellow is obviously the hydrophobic tails. Now, these are phospholipids that do this, and they do it spontaneously, abiotically. They don't need a living thing to do that. This is just physics or chemistry. Polar things are attracted to polar things, and nonpolar things are attracted to other nonpolar things and repelled by the opposite of one another. That's just physics and chemistry. There's nothing biological about that happening. Living things take advantage of that, though, because in an aqueous world, a world full of water, you can use the uh, nature of these molecules to form a packet, a bubble, a cell membrane that on the inside you can put organelles. So you can make an entity or a unit. And then with the cells, uh, uh, membranes as they evolve, you can actually take that and use it to make it semi-permeable. Some, certain things can go through, certain things are not. So there's up close, you see, once again, those phospholipids attracted to the water those hydrophilic heads. Remember, what, okay, what was the name for this kind of a molecule that is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic? There you go, thank you. So an ambivalent molecule like that or amphipathic molecule like that makes up the cell membranes. Now, we can do lots of things with those things. For example, if we saturate or unsaturate the tails of those phospholipids, and I'm hoping you know what I'm talking about, saturating, remember, double bonds or not, if we unsaturate or saturate those tails, unsaturated tails, uh, the double bond will bend, and when they're saturated tails, the, uh, the, the phospholipids are nice and straight, so we can change the viscosity of the cell. We can make it very fluid, you know, very runny, or very viscous, kind of like syrup. Uh, animal cells can insert things like cholesterol, and that can do stuff like affect the fluidity of the uh, membrane, especially at low temperatures. You see that last little part? That's kind of cool. Animals that live in Arctic climates, or Antarctic, or just hell where it's cold, uh, one of the things they have to be concerned about is, is damage to their membrane. Their, their, their membrane's uh, uh, solidifying when it gets real cold outside. The cholesterol that animals can inject into their membrane uh, or, or remove as necessary will prevent that from happening. It's kind of like there are fish down uh, near Antarctica whose blood is actually uh, uh, made up of a substance that's antifreeze. That's why they don't freeze at temperatures that are below freezing. Water isn't necessarily ice always when it's at below freezing temperature. It has a lot to do with other things like pressure, but these animals live in that really cold water and they have that, uh, that built-in antifreeze. This is a cool picture. This is what we call the fluid mosaic model. I'm writing all that out if you're going, what did he say? Mosaic, mosaic model of cell membrane structure. It was, um, yeah, I think so too. You can see why it's fluid. It's got the fluid arrangement mosaic because it's made up of lots of things. This was... Um, only fully understood in the early 70s. So this is some relatively new science. Uh, again, you recognize a lot of it, I hope. There's the phospholipid bilayers, the peripheral and integral proteins, the actin filaments on the inside, all of that stuff on the extracellular matrix on the outside. Um, there's a couple of things that are called glycolipids and glycoproteins. Uh, the glycolipid is the lipid tails of the uh, phospholipid, but now there's sugars on there instead of a, uh, instead of a hydrophilic head. Uh, glycoproteins are going to be sugar and protein together. Now, notice the glycolipids and glycoproteins are facing both to the outside of the cell, right? Glycolipids and glycoproteins have a very important function. What they do is they give the cell identity. You see the, the, the structure of the glyco part of that. You see in the background, this glycolipid in the background has got, you know, a branch structure is genetically determined. So the structure of your glycolipids 
and my glycolipids, unless we're identical twins, is going to be identical. This is how your immune system knows that if a cell is foreign or not. You know, how does an immune system know that a cell is from some bacteria that's trying to make you sick unless it know that, knows that that cell is either one of mine or from a bacterium? It does it by feeling the glycolipids. Literally, the, 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 the uh, uh, immune system cell tries to bond by feeling with those glycolipids and those glycoproteins. And if it feels the right fit, it says, okay, that's a host cell, no big deal. And if it feels the glycolipids that are different, it tries to attack it. That's why people with transplant uh, organs have a uh, you know, problem with tissue rejection because the immune system doesn't recognize the glycolipids or glycoproteins. Now, doctors can give immunosuppressant drugs in hopes that your immune system will eventually come to accept it. The uh, problem with immunosuppressant drugs is there's lots of things out there that would like to make you sick that your immune system is necessary for. Um, Sometimes the body will just naturally learn to accept it. Sometimes it never does. Those of you with allergies, that's what your your body is doing. Allergies is your immune system going haywire, going overblown. It's it's saying, oh, we got to get rid of this pollen. It's bad for you. Well, pollen's not bad for you, right? But your your immune system doesn't know that sees that it's foreign. That's why identical twins. I always tell my students, if you have an identical twin, they're a good good source of spare parts. By the way, because you the glycolipids and glycoproteins on the identical twins should genetically be very close, if not exactly identical. The reason why I say very close is I've been reading recently that identical twins may not be exactly identical, which is kind of cool. Uh, all right, what are some of these things that these proteins do? Yeah, it does. Yeah, a lot of our immune, pro a lot of problems we have in our, our bodies are actually autoimmune, is our body immune system going crazy. We have, we have a very touchy immune system. All right, what are some of the things that these uh, proteins in the membrane do? Well, transport, yeah, same thing. They can move things through the membrane, uh, like you see there. Uh, they can move things through the membrane, notice, with the gradient. What I mean by that is going from higher to lower concentration, so like a boulder rolling downhill. Uh, some of these transport uh, 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 proteins can actually move things against the gradient. But of course, there's a price for that. You got to have energy to move things uphill. Some act as enzymes, sometimes in a variety of enzymes, like in a you know in a conveyor belt arrangement. Oh, I talked about this signal transduction. Uh, the molecule from your pituitary, the hormone, attaching to the membrane on your sex, your gonads, the signal that's transduced or the signals relayed is you know time to become sexually mature, time to start you know producing sperm or start ovulating eggs. Uh, here's your immune system, right? Cell-to-cell <clears throat> -cell recognition. Tight junction. That's a tight junction. And, of course, I showed you attached to the extracellular matrix. So lots of things that those proteins do. What I really want to focus on, though, is the way things are moved across the membrane of cells. And I'm going to break this down into two large categories and several smaller ones. The two large categories are going to be based on whether energy is involved or not. So this first slide that you see here are all processes that move things across the membranes passively. Now, what do we mean when we say a process is passive in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of energy? An example would be a rock rolling downhill. That's right. No energy. No energy is involved in a passive process. So let's start with one of the simplest ones. Uh, if you're looking at that picture first, the little green molecules would represent oxygen. Now, you always have oxygen diffusing into your lung cells because your lung cells are always moving oxygen around to the rest of your body, so they're always low on oxygen. <clears throat> so since the lung cell on the right is lower than oxygen on the left, things roll downhill. And oxygen can very easily, it's called simple direct diffusion can simply move through the phospholipid bilayer. Things that move through the phospholipid bi bilayer by direct diffusion do it without energy, passively move from higher to lower. End of story, nothing to that. Oxygen moves into our, our lung cells that way and then carbon dioxide, because hemoglobin, the protein, also carries carbon dioxide, diffuses out of our lungs into the air spaces, which we then exhale. All right, simple enough. 
Okay, the next three involve the same idea. They're still passive. You're still going higher to lower, but they need a little bit of help. Uh, the next two are called facilitated diffusion, and in facilitated diffusion, there's a protein channel, a protein channel which allows the molecule to flow still in the same direction from higher to lower, but it allows, for example, I hinted to this earlier, ions to go through. You see, ions are charged, right? They're polar. So they got no problem with the hydrophilic heads on one side, but as soon as they clear through that hydrophilic head, like if they were the oxygen molecules, the hydrophobic tails would reject them. So the, pole, uh, the, the protein channel, we call this facilitated diffusion, because it's diffusion higher to lower, but protein channel uh, uh, provides the avenue for that thing would normally not be able to get through there to, to move through from one side to the other. Again, higher to lower. Uh, a protein carrier facilitated diffusion is very much the same thing, but it's specific. A protein carrier is going to be specific for the molecule, so it's going to be shaped a certain way, and only when that molecule, that purple one in this case, binds, does the rest of that open up and allow that thing to go through. You're still moving higher to lower, right? You're still going from higher to lower. No energy is involved, but you're just doing it in these two here with a, with a carrier protein, we call them, a helper protein, a carrier protein. The last one uses a carrier protein, but this is a very specific one, too. It's so it's kind of like the protein carrier. This is an aquaporin. Aquaporins only allow water through. Of course, that's important for cells. All right, so water moves through these things called aquaporins. Now, uh, I, I, I want to talk a little more in detail about this process of osmosis, but let's uh, let's run through and take a look at some of these other uh, images I have of diffusion. Uh, again, diffusion higher to lower, thing uh, down below, things are going to diffuse independent of one another. So the yellow molecules on the left are going to diffuse onto the right, so they're equal uh, in yellow, and then the purple ones are going to diffuse, so they're equal. So that's what I mean about oxygen diffusing in and carbon dioxide diffusing out in your cells. They're going to diffuse independent of one another. They're always going to go from higher to lower. Um, so there's a channel protein, right, letting things through. There's a carrier protein letting things through. A carrier protein, again, would be the same as a, a channel. This is facilitated diffusion again, but uh, in the case of a carrier protein, maybe it's an ion that can't go through the tails, and a carrier protein, again, is going to be specific, right? So it's going to work like a valve. Every time one of those round or whatever shape molecule binds to that receptor site, that protein, shape, 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 is going to bloop allow that material to work. But always moving higher to lower. All right, let's talk about water now. Let's do the aquaporins thing for a second. In this picture, what I've got is a selectively permeable membrane. So the little channels you see between there would be the aquaporins, okay? It's selectively permeable. Certain things could go through. Certain things are allowed through. We saw that with the protein channels, right? The facilitated diffusion. Only things that fit that binding site will be allowed to go through. All right, now, in this particular example, let's imagine on the right-hand side of the membrane is the cytoplasm in your cell, <clears throat> and on the left-hand side would be the uh, your bloodstream. So this would be at the interface between your bloodstream and a cell that's being supplied, a capillary, whatever the case may be. The uh, red and the white little things you got to recognize, those are water molecules, and the big green things are sugar molecules. It, it could be protein, uh, it could be any solute. I anything that dissolves in water. And you remember when I showed you when water d uh, dissolves things, what it does is it basically, uh, well, it, it gangs up on them, right? It, it, it makes these hydration shells all around these uh, solute molecules. Now, here's the thing how that affects water. Now, the process of osmosis, by the way, let me make sure I get this straight. Osmosis is diffusion only of water. So other things diffuse, but only water diffuses through osmosis. It goes in the same direction, though, still higher to lower, but we're only talking about water. All right, here's how solute plays into the game, though. When solute molecules are dissolved in water, those water molecules stick to it and form those hydration shells. Now, those water molecules that are stuck to the solute are known as bound water molecules. They're bound. They're stuck to something. Bound water molecules cannot pass through the membrane. They're too big. They're stuck to something. 
They can't drag them, all their other buddies that are stuck to that sugar molecule and the sugar molecule through the membrane. It won't work. So osmosis is, is diffusion, but it's diffusion of unbound water molecules. So the only thing that can move through in this picture are the little red and white ones that aren't stuck to a sugar molecule. And you notice if you look in this picture, the reason why osmosis is pointing to the right is if you notice with the unbound water molecules, there's more of those on the left than there is on the right, isn't there? Not the bound, but the unbound. There's more of these here than there is here. So osmosis says more of those unbound water molecules are gonna flow across. You see, osmosis tries to balance out what it can. And the only thing you can balance in terms of water in this case are the unbound water molecules. So it's going to do that. Now, the net result, though, the net result is that organisms or cells can gain or lose water. So let's take a look at what that looks like. First, we'll do uh, animal cells and then down below are plant cells. So let's start in the middle. Let's start with an environment that's known as isotonic. So these are environmental terms. In other words, the cell, what kind of environment is the cell in? In your body or in a beaker in a lab? What kind of environment is that cell in? And tonic refers to uh, tonicity. I'm going to spell that. Word. And tonicity is just a fancy word for the amount of solute, right? The amount of stuff dissolved. All right, so let's go isotonic first. You know what iso mean, iso means same. Tonic, I just told you, means solute. So what we mean by isotonic, when a cell is in an isotonic environment, the amount of solute in the cell equals the amount of solute outside the cell. Red blood cells have a solute concentration a little less than 1%, about 0.9. If I put a red blood cell into a 0.9% solute beaker, it would be in an isotonic solution. Now, the rule of thumb in osmosis, it's easy to get confused, but if you follow this rule, rule of thumb, you won't make a mistake. Water always moves to the side of the membrane where there is more solute. Water always moves to the side of the cell's membrane, they either in or out, where there's more solute. If the solute is equal, then there's no net water loss or no net water gain. Water moves in and out like the arrows show you at equal rate. The same thing happens in a plant cell, but in a plant cell, we call it flaccid. Flaccid is, is a, like a half-blown up balloon. An animal cell is very happy in this isotonic state. It's called normal. Now, let's take the animal cell, the red blood cell, and put it into a hypertonic. Hyper means elevated. So this would be the ocean. The ocean is about three and a half percent salty, much more salty than, uh, than the red blood cell, which is 0.9. So if you look at this, water always goes to the side of the membrane where there's more salt. If you put a red blood cell into a hypertonic environment, it's going to shrivel, it's gonna lose water. Conversely, if you put it into a hypotonic environment where the solute is less in the environment, water always goes to the side of the membrane where there's more, Water flows in, and if you're an animal cell, that may not be good. You might lice. Plant cells, on the, on the other hand, they like being in hypotonic. They don't like hypertonic, okay? That's called plasmalized. They've lost water, and the actual plasma membrane will sometimes pull away from the wall. That's not good. Uh, flaccid is okay, but they'd rather be turgid. They'd rather be in a hypotonic environment with water constantly flowing into them. And the reason is, well, what we said before, you know, they can't go get water. So why not store as much as you can? And you can do that because you got a cell wall. So as that uh, a vacuole is growing and pushing against that cell wall, you don't have to worry about the animal cell lysing. You're going to be able to blow that balloon up in a box and keep it alive. So when we return back to this critter with this contractile vacuole, if you've been paying attention to what I said about environment, what type of environment does a critter with a contractile vacuole live in? Now, what I mean, what type, I'm talking about tonicity, hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. So what kind of environment do you think this contractile vacuole possessing critter would live in? 
Courtney says hypotonic. Anybody else? Does everybody agree with Courtney? Yep. See what I mean by form and function again? Things that have contractile vacuoles have them because they need them. They need them because water is always pouring into them. So in order to get rid of that excess water, like I said, they have a contractile vacuum. Why is water always pouring into them? Because they live in hypotonic environments. They don't have a cell wall to deal with that, though. So if they don't have that and they continue to fill, 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 fill with water, they're going to do what? What will happen if they fill up too much with too much water? Will they suffer the same thing as the animal cell did? Yeah, they'll burst, won't they? They'll explode. You blow them up too far. So you got to have that contractile vacuole. All right. Now next. You're going to see some uh, questions on an exam very similar to this. So I'm going to go over these, uh, go over this with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to put a cell into a hypothetical environment. Like you see, the cell here is a balloon. I've labeled it the cell and I put some solutes in it, some sucrose and glucose. And then I've also got an environment out there, all right? You can see the environment that I have. It's uh, sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And I'm doing all this with, with molarity, all right? So there, don't worry if you remember what molarity is. That's okay, Seth, or anything like that. Uh, just pay attention to the numbers. Take care, Seth. All right, now, we take a look at this. Uh, when you look at these problems on the exam, it, 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 think about doing them in steps. Here's the kind of like we're doing with the metric system. The first thing is I'm going to have to tell you, I'm going to have to tell you in the exam question, what the membrane of the cell is permeable to. In other words, what things will go through and what things will not go through. So in this particular example, see, how do I want to do this? All right, in this particular example, sucrose cannot move through the membrane. Glucose can, fructose can, uh, sucrose will not move through the membrane. Glu sucrose in red uh, does not pass through. So the 3 or 0.03 molar sucrose in the cell will stay there, and the 0.01 in the environment will not. All right, now your question, which way is the water going to flow? Is it going to flow into the cell, out of the cell, or is it going to be isotonic? Courtney says it'll flow into the cells. Does everybody agree with her? Okay. Here's how we do this. Remember I said there's a trick to it. I'm going to tell you what permeates through, or what can go through the cell and what cannot go through the cell. All right. Whatever I tell you goes through the cell, ignore. They're detractors. Don't worry about the amounts. Don't worry if there's more than one amount than the other. Don't worry about any of that. Don't worry about the numbers at all. The reason why you don't have to worry about them is they're going to go through diffusion to equal themselves out. Remember, diffusion is independent of one another. Uh, 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 items will move across. Glucose will move across until it's balanced across. So that would be 0.03 divided by 2. Uh, the the 0.01 molar fructose is going to balance. So ignore those. The only one you have to be concerned about, that's why I put it in red, is the sucrose. It does not move. So now back to uh, the original question. You still agree with Courtney? Is the water going to move into the cell or out of the cell if we ignore the things that are going to move anyway? So what kind of environment is this cell in right now? Use those iso, hypo, or hypertonic. What kind of environment is this cell in? It's in a hypotonic environment, right? All right, so now I, I'm at class time, but it, this is real important. You understand how I did that? There's going to be a series of these on the exam. I'm going to tell you what, per, what, what goes through the membrane, what does not. Whatever goes through the membrane, scratch that out. Ignore that. It will do its thing. Look at what's left and compare the concentrations. Where there's more concentration, more molars, that's where the water's going to go. What if the molarity of the sucrose on the inside, one more question, I'll let you go, was 0.01 molar inside? Where would the water go or what type of environment would that be?
Hey, so the water uh, technically would move, Courtney, right? But in equilibrium. Absolutely. Very good. Any questions, folks? All right, that's it for lecture. Again, make sure that you uh, uh, check your uh, exams. Take a look at them. If you got any questions, give me a holler, and I will see you all next week.